Welcome. This is the January 24th Open ZFS Production Users Call. We have Greg, Stu, Jan, Jim, Daniel, Katya, Rod, and myself, Michael. And uh, Daniel's been making great progress with his Zelta awk based replication tool. And being awk based it is portable to most Unix systems and does not require a receiving client at the other end. I've been using it. I'm happy with it. Daniel, maybe give... Uh, your latest pitch on it and tell us what funny autisms you've been hitting. Yeah, so uh, Zelta is Sanoid for your drunk grandma. Um, to, uh, it, it's, it's basically the same thing that many of us have done. You know, I've been working on an in-house backup tool because nothing was exactly right for, for my house. And um, I needed something that did uh, the uh, the the original Oracle ZFS dash lowercase r, which would um, get get a directory tree to a point in time to a particular snapshot without uh, replicating the uh, the the originals. Um, and then it sort of just evolved from there. Um, yeah, so so now I've got it. I've got handling a bunch of different. Uh, I think I think backups, backup and uh, replication uh, scenarios, and some portability. Finally, I attempted to make it portable, and it was it seemed to be working in all kinds of aux all over all over the land. And what did I run into? Uh, my first, uh, I think, attempted Linux user said my code was broken, and I gave Linux no love. This was not true. The mock developers didn't give Debian any love, uh, any love because there was a mock bug um, where it did not correctly identify uh, the, the types between, um, between functions. So uh, that has been fixed in FreeBSD. It has not yet been fixed in Debian, but I fixed my code to, to work around this little mock bug. And now we have a, uh, a slightly more portable junk script used by six people uh, that is hopefully getting uh, better by the week. Well, be, being that Pretty obnoxious... Soon that'll be seven people. Yeah, being that obnoxious Linux guy, the last poll I did, it did not throw an error. So that's improvement. <laughs> there, there's a start. There's a start. Yeah, uh, I also... Uh, who said, who said uh, PV piping? Because I was doing a lot of error handling internally. So I did uh, PV, so for um, filtering, and of course it'll use FreeBSD's DD for status, uh, but that that's that's in, that's from an environment variable. That's not uh, that's not a switch or anything yet. I do want it to be portable, so like figuring out which thing is going to do bandwidth limiting on multiple OSs or do. Um, uh, what do you call it? Like a like a PV style progress viewer on multiple OSs. That might be tricky. So I might not have that as a feature in as a switch, just because it's you know because I can't count on any of those things being there. I mean, I guess I could put logic to to figure it out, but uh, I don't know how authority I, I want to make this sucker. There's already better tools oh, out there. You might want to look at the name. Uh, when I went Googling for Zelta, I immediately found a ton of very high profile hits and had to look hard to find what you're doing. Even when I changed my Google to Zelta ZFS, there's an AI well, company that's getting a lot of Google juice right now. And uh, there are like a couple of other things named Zelta that have been around for a while. Latvian so if that's yeah. any <laughs> kind of a concern to you. I just want to go ahead and put that out there because namespace uh, my bitch. Yeah, it might be. I mean, this is a this is, you know, questionably going to be. Uh, this this is my first piece of open source code at age forty, almost seven. So, uh, you know, it's not. I don't. I don't know exactly what I want to do with it right now, other than make it handy for uh, for lots of people. But if it, there's a Google thing, so it's not gonna. It's it's not. I'm not gonna be able to compete with that. Um, all right, we'll, 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 we'll think about, we'll think about that, but, but I must say that it has no users yet. So it's got uh, seven, it's got seven, you know, 
That's but, uh, why I brought this I, up because that's the time to fix name issues when you don't have users right. yet. Once you've already got users, well, yep. We even yeah, have a command right. issue in so far as Z pull is also a push, so that might need some love. So yeah, we've been chatting. Right. About this. Well, I was I was changing it. To somebody, the, the somebody, sort of... go to, go describe it to Chat GPT and ask Chat what it should be called. Oh, jeez. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I came up with I did actually and oh, it's like, you know, shadows something, twin something. The, uh, there are a few, few things that I think Chat GPT are good for and picking names is one of them. Yeah. Hmm, All right, well, Jim, thanks for the advice. I I right now let's call it in code slush. I might have uh I might have uh, the Clara folks give it a tune up and see if it's worth uh open sourcing for real under a, under MIT wrong. or something and getting it out there. But uh, um, yeah, right now, um, yeah, I'm not really pitching it to anybody but this call. So I better get ready. So Stu, you used it in happiness or anger. How did that go? I haven't, I've just, Smoked us. Basically, I mean, I've moved eight gig around, uh, so uh, I haven't put it through its full paces yet. But it is no longer breaking instantly, so that's a feature improvement. Yeah, there's also uh, the the true grandma mode. So Zelta space backup slip space source space target uh, snapshots. Then you know does a inclusive sync of any snapshot in any history on any child that there is to the target. And then the exact same command to repeat. So yeah, grandma mode, I love it. I'll make it Zelta grandma. That, that I bet you, no, that'll still come up because it's Latvian, it's a Latvian name. So Zelta grandma it. will come up. Oh yeah, that, that, that would, <laughs> what's, what's grandma in Latvian? Uh, that's mom. <laughs> <laughs> How does running Zelta sync differ from running syncloid with the dash R flag? It doesn't. It's exactly the same. Oh, okay. There's no there's no difference at all. Yeah, no, everything everything syncloid does, it's you have much more control over policy. So Z REPL and Syncoid both have uh you know more fine-tuned policies. And so, so Zelta's approach right now is for um, basically as a as a migration tool and as a and and the policy is is specific was invented specifically for my fleet, which is every single snapshot is unique. So I worked backwards and added some okay, add the host name or you know add a couple of prefixes and stuff like that, but it's. It is it is not a per snapshot policy. So Sanoid Syncoid is much more robust in those areas. And I don't know if I even want to uh you know, I, I think I think I want to stick to the easy road. Like here's mm -hmm. how you can do a fake uh a fake cluster with all the machines on both of your machines up on two on two of your hosts, and whichever one's written is the one that replicates over. So I have a I have a quick proof of concept in that, and I think I'm going to put that in in prod. Um, but it will have a half dozen use cases. If you want to invent your use case, you use Sanoid Syncoid. I think that's that's how I want to approach this. Does that make that that makes sense, right? Um. Well, so I, I want to be very careful and very clear here. To to I, I'm not it in any way trying to neg you out of your project at all. I'm just, I'm trying to, to understand. And right now, so Sanoid is a lot more complicated, obviously, but Syncoid itself, if you run it with no arguments other than dash R, as far as I can tell, it's exactly the same. Um, yeah. But, but I'm worried that I'm missing something. What no, requirements does it have at the destination, if I may, if any? None. It's uh, just Perl on the, oh, on the, Syncoid? on the sender. Okay, only the yeah. center. Yeah, Syn Syncoid doesn't care either. Syncoid um, is, it, it does all the orchestration, but there's nothing required other than ZFS 
on the on the other end for nice. uh, for sync load. Well, I mean, if you want to use its built-in, you know, compression and and et cetera, then you might need, you know, um, you might need LZOP on the other end, uh, you know, something like that, you know, dependencies, but you don't need like actual syncoid. And for the most part, you usually don't need the other things either. It depends on whether you're pushing or pulling, basically. Yeah. So as you yeah. know, FreeBSD dropped Perl at 5.0, as I recall. So I believe uh, Zelta is, or whatever name it will have is purely using in-base tools. If that's. Accurate. So did you have in 20, in 2019, did you have, you had a dash lowercase R that did a, a single snapshot replication across like the, just the latest, the latest of the new ones across. Cause I think, I think Alan got me into ZX for, which didn't have that. And then I think I had problems in 2019 with, uh, with, with, uh, with Syncoid running and not root. Cause I've never run ZFS replications with, with non root. Um, so that's how the project started. That was obviously five years ago. And then I've only started refactoring for public consumption in the last, you know, month and a half. So I, I think that, that's, your the, issue that's the was story the, of how it exists. I suspect your issue was the was the non-root delegation. Um, Dash R has been in Syncoid since before the public ever even saw it. It was there from day one. However, I didn't start messing around with... Uh, experimenting with uh, with delegation until very recently uh, within like the last couple of years honestly um right you can see so, yeah, some my... uh, yeah you you yeah. can there, there's an article on clara where you can see like what was required to get syncwood working with delegation the uh, part right. of the issue is that i was trying to approach that concept before zfs delegation was even available so yeah right the original versions of syncoid allowed you to set things up using sudo to try to you know narrow down the amount of permissions that were required um right. and that that's in there by default now that's actually kind of getting in the way and in the near future i'm actually going to make the uh, i'm not going to pull out the sudo capabilities completely but I'm going to make them non-default. So you have to actually issue an argument if you want to use that, because what it ends up doing more frequently now is getting in the way of people that are just trying to get ZFS, ZFS delegation working for what they need. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it was definitely, it, it's definitely a, a, a psychological fork at uh, like 20, 2018, 2019. I will say that uh, nothing will make you want to write your own faster than trying to use ZX for for a couple of years, um, <laughs> there, I believe it. it. So, um, okay. So so what about your uh, so my dash cap my dash capital I will do so dash R will do a snapshot point across or the latest the latest one recursively, mm -hmm. and then and then can you do? So I've had I've had trouble with dash capital R with with varying snapshots underneath. So you take a backup drive with different snapshot policies, and then you you do a ZFS send dash capital R. Um, and yeah, I don't do that because strange I've found, things happen. Yeah, inordinate yeah. problems with trying to do ZFS send with a dash R. That's why Syncoid goes through and, and handles the child data sets one by one as right, far as right. the actual yeah, ZFS so did, send. Oh, yeah. 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 Receiving, so I did that. Yeah, um, I did that also. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, if anything, this thing is going to be a learning experience. Um, Sin dash R I, works okay if you've got a static set of data sets that never changes on either end. But if you end up right. adding extra data sets on the source after you've done a recursive send and receive to the target, when you do your next one, you have problems because now you've got some data sets that need a full and others that need an incremental. So everything essentially just bombs out. Um, yep. I don't remember exactly the failure mode other than it's absolutely fail and you need to avoid doing that, which is why I stopped even trying to use recursive send. The yeah. problem is yeah. that uh, it fails because it will decide which starting data set to use uh, on the root data uh, set you use for your recursive transfer. And then yeah, the well, snapshot a, yeah. will not exist. So it yeah. it say that basically yes, yeah, source not available, you, can't create incremental whatever. You need it's to a be string, careful so... what capital R means in a ZFS. Yeah. Not mean recursion. 
It does not mean and the other problem is the means uh, replicate, replication right. of all the properties, which is what really breaks your poor uh, backup target. Uh, if, for example, you have backup a full system with boot environments. Good luck. Uh, because yeah, I mean, of course, of total course, chaos when you a... mount the, hmm. uh, the backup server and the backup data sets on top of each other. Yeah. But yeah. So you must be very careful to not, not in my opinion, a backup server shouldn't even mount them normally. So yeah, should, I don't mount by just... default. I mean, yeah, that that's another thing is is he can't he can't back up zero with a like you can't like have a what? free BSD box back up zero onto a disk and not expect it not to destroy your life. Of so, course you can. Like dash what? x mount point with a lot of dashes. Yeah, with a lot of dashes. That's right. I, I think that, yeah. So no, grandma no, needs a backup. The tool. only one you need is mount point. If you're going to replicate. Boot environment, you just and then you reboot, and then, yeah. No, right. no, 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 yeah. You, when receiving, you can make sure that you mask out what you receive, override this property, and then you have to store it out of band somewhere, yeah. That's for example what ZX does. I think it, it didn't remember if it uses user properties or a simple flat file. I don't remember. never had too many dashes yeah so as long as you make sure that you can't mount it yeah the problem is that you uh, want to preserve the mount point property if you ever restore it because if you lose that you have the file system content actually you just actually don't you have don't want all the you, you that mount point just blow it away if it's root environment stuff because you don't want it there when you go to restore it because you don't want you're trying to restore it to a running system, and if you have it mount over the top of your existing running route, your restore is just going to go haywire. You oh, don't. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of replicating boot environments. Yep. Intuitively, you would think dash U might you make you to... safe, and it doesn't. Interesting. So the the biggest thing that I want to say here is we're dancing around the reason why you really don't want to get into mount point spaghetti on your pool. Uh, you should have a very few explicitly set mount points and let the rest of it inherit. That way you don't really need to worry about backing up the mount points so much because it's going to be very easy. If you're ready to make your backup production, ZFS set mount point equals whatever for the root of your backup. And then the rest of it just all falls into line. Who who is the guy that who is the guy that decided who is the guy that decided the Z root? Uh, Mister G, perhaps. Okay, I don't know. I I get it at some I get it at some level. I I don't get it at at many uh, other levels. Rodney, you had something. Yeah, that's one of the reasons for using what are called deep boot environments so that you get rid of this thing like slash var and slash temp and as set mount points. Those are actually become um, slash become pool name slash root slash name boot environment slash temp. And that's how the all they're all inherited and the boot time mounting code knows how to deal with that fact that you have a deep boot environment and this gets you down to the situation where a boot environment is is a, a straight hierarchy stored in slash full name slash root and from there the, the data sets are, are all underneath each other from there on down and so um, it's only one point that you have to screw with all the others are inherited then what about shared home or something that you truly might want to cross boot environment? Those you those don't go inside your boot environment. Those are external yeah. to yep. your yep. Yep. You, those just There's out, another out problem the why you have to do it that way, and that is you need a data set to contain, contain each of your boot environments as a child data set. So, so you could argue that that could be at the top level, but then you your Boot environment names would clash with all your other top level data sets. So you want to have your pool, then your 
data set containing your boot environment and then the boot environments under that. So it makes total sense that you have to have uh, one label. We can argue about if it's a well-chosen name, but the thing with doing it with these levels of interactions, uh, that's not uh, optional. Any other thoughts on layouts and replication and such? I'm slightly convinced. Slightly convinced on nested or deep boot environments or what? Deep. Deep. Amen. Yeah. Especially if you were to use the FreeBSD loader in Illumos to dual boot those OSs. And uh, Rodney, briefly, I know you had some neat progress last time about dual booting. Was it FreeBSD and Proxmox ARM on a banana pie or something similar? Orange pie, rather. Any news on that front? Not, not much progress, but yes, it is uh, dual booting. Um, Proxmox and FreeBSD from a common pool on ARM architecture. Keep and I've done the same thing on x86. Oh, sorry about that. You've done the same on x86, right? Correct. Love it. Any Rodney, questions for Rodney relating to that? For fun and your... I have something I wanted to point out about Wait, the so... whole. Uh, Just wondering, Roddy. Dan had a question there. Your spare time, or, or or what? That's pretty amazing. Somebody, you people keep walking over the top of Dan, so yeah, I can't hear what he's. It's doing. tricky. So Dan asked, "Are you doing this for fun or day job or what?" So Dan L asked, "Are you doing this for fun? What motivates this?" Who me? I uh, know Dan Rob, Langell. Okay, I'll, I'll yeah. ask it again. Rod, what the hell are you doing? Is this for fun or or just to prove it can be done? Because it sounds interesting to me. It's it's more than just fun. It's that it's a simplification of my very now complicated working environment. So um, because I have to work cross platform. Um, and it's become imperative that I am more readily able to do so and share large amounts of data between many, many different environments. And so I kind of decided that, that ZFS and being able to multiply boot the same operating system out of the same pool is just going to become a necessity to my future workflow. I mean, that's one of the things that ZFS was supposed to do is be able to. Yeah, oh, and this I'm is just this, glad to see it working that way. Yeah, it's I'm actually if it weren't for bootloader problems, I would be much further down the road. But the complexity of how do I. What what bootloader do I use to load Illuminos from a free from a ZFS pool in EFI? Um, the, the bigger questions are the Linux based distros. I mean, Grub was severely crippled by the fact that Grub can only read a restricted CFS pool. I don't want that. I have to be able to read a fully functional pool. Well, system D boot came along with Proxmox and that can actually read a full functional pool. So I now have a Linux bootloader that can load Linux kernels from ZFS, standard vanilla, open ZFS 2.2. And that's gained me some flexibility. There's still some hard coding of stupid stuff going on, but I'm hoping very soon to be able to change from just saying Proxmox to actually being able to say Debian. Look at ZFS and boot menu. ZFS boot menu does not use Grub and it does not have the limitation that you're talking about. It's exactly what you want. And you can have a Debian system based on ZFS boot menu today. Where does that come from? You have a URL? ZFS boot menu.org. Oh, there you go. Okay. 
That's an easy one, and thank you for that tip. Because I can, I can already build the data sets for Debian from FreeBSD. I can, I can use it. Came from I think somebody in here or in one of the other calls. This Deb Bootstrap. There is actually a port of it that allows me to build the the Bootstrap environment and everything from FreeBSD, and that all works. The problem is, is I can't get it to boot because there's some functionality with System D boot. Yeah, ser seriously, just look at ZFS boot menu. I mean, you're okay. going to be done in an hour. It, there's there's a walkthrough for installing Debian. Like it's not it's not end user level easy. Like you do actually have to pop a shell during the installer and you know set a couple things up manually and and then fire off the rest of the install script manually. But I mean, it's it's no harder than getting like a ZFS root was on FreeBSD back in the you know seven point X and eight point X days. And that's just a one-stop shop. You'll be done. You're just you're just gonna walk through the instructions and be done. You're gonna have boot environments, everything. One single pool, no limitations. Can it load a free BSD kernel? I have no idea. I bet it Does can. Anyone know of anyone it's a, it's a, it? that's fine. That's that's fine because it's an EFI and I can I can already deal yeah. with that at the EFI loader selection layer. So yeah, let, let, let me rephrase that. Um the bootloader can, whether you're going to have to do the, whether you will, or the amount of monkeying you'll need to do with the project to get it to do it, I don't know. But the the loader itself is is refi, um, refined. You know, it's the same thing that you use to boot like Hackintoshes and whatever. Uh, yeah, it can read it. Okay. And Jan, you were it asking like use really K-exec? Nice Sorry. Go ahead. Just joking as an right. idea on how to load a kernel if you don't want yeah. to deal with a bootloader. Okay, Daniel, you I'm had not... something and you're pretty quiet, uh, Dan Landry. Am I, is my volume way down? Yeah, your volume's uh, down. That might be why we've been kind of stepping on each other's toes, but hey. It, is that better now? A little bit, sure. Uh, um, go ahead. I just read Z ZFS bootmenu.org and it sounds really really good when do we get it standard on freebsd well it sounds like everyone has a little homework I'm not expecting an answer I'm not expecting an answer anything else on cross booting has anyone else had successes or attempts with different os's on a common z pool I think ZFS boot menu should very quickly become a port in FreeBSD. Hint, 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 who out there maintains ports? Goran's been know. pretty responsive. Uh, he was on yesterday's call because I can put you in touch. Oop, that didn't. Let me fix that URL. You sound like you have a new release here. Boom, boom, boom. Let's see. There it is. Oh, but if it's uh yeah, if it's an EFI image, you just drop that in place, no? Recovery image. I like it. Uh so yeah, uh Rod, let's get Goran on the line and uh maybe he can port that. He was super quick about the the emulated TPM payload that is hopefully showing up in uh Beehive soon. Anyhow, boom. Okay, anything else on that topic? Uh, for whatever it's worth, I have talked to the folks that uh, that run that project. Uh, yep. They're nice folks, and uh, if anybody needs an introduction for some reason, then let me know. Like, I mean, I'm not like tight or anything, but sure. we definitely know who each other is, and I've promoted that project before. So, good to hear. Okay, Andrew H, you had something possibly on the same topic, possibly completely new. Um. No, it was with the previous topic where we were talking about doing backup stuff. Yeah, no worries. And Go for it. Particularly with uh, mount points clobbering each other. The other place that you might see that is, is seeing stuff coming from um, an Illumos type environment because we will actually put to where we have mount points, multiple mount points that are named the same. And then they have the zoned flag for being in zones. Ah, and so they don't mount in the global uh, machine. They mount in the zone, in the appropriate zone. So 
If someone's doing a backup from an Illumo system, you may still run into a problem because of that. Is that a an attribute that's just thrown in the private attribute for zoned? Uh, or, uh, yeah. Okay. It's just yeah, it's just zoned. And is that just a Boolean on or off, or does it yep. give it more information? Okay. Well, that's just a good on heads or off. up. Thank you. So, like back... jail Go ahead. would cause yeah. trouble on the FreeBSD side. And. Uh, sorry, you think that would be? That. You mentioned poss the possibility of a jailed parameter on FreeBSD, but you yeah. think that would cause more trouble than it would help with? Maybe. I don't know. Cool. I don't back up my jailed ones because I because those are like Poudre like stuff that I don't care to back up too much. Cool. Uh then. Moving on rapid fire, uh, Rod, you were thinking, hey, you know, it sure is helpful to have an empty data set. I find it invaluable for, say, a object directory. But do you think that should be maybe a default under certain circumstances or all circumstances? Let her rip. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if we shouldn't have the ability to, rather than um, destroy and recreate a data set, just say, rewind it to empty. I mean, there's there are several different scenarios and use cases where you want to do that objects an obvious example for for me it's often uh huge source trees that, that are coming out of somewhere or other temporary work environment stuff that that i'm pulling in and out and i just okay i get that and i'm done with it and or i end up in some state that oh i'm totally screwed here i just gonna wipe it all out and start over it just seems like to me it's, it would be trivial for zfs just to Restore a data set to empty. Do you think it should I mean, be just implied at creation snapshot. time? Are you thinking create data set and boom, there's an empty? Oh. This would have saved you, Michael, last week. <laughs> yeah, with I did your, the... yeah, because you had uh, you had Swiss cheese snapshots. So uh, this is true. Yeah, getting getting the, getting the tree getting the tree over was a little little dicey, but I I, I would I would vote for that if there was an election yep that would i be would nice. vote for always making sure that you're taking automated snapshots on a regular basis in which case this doesn't really wind up being that useful because you're definitely going to have something within an hour of when you created that data set anyway what if you create the data set and immediately put data in there when you want to return to the empty state let's say you create a build jail and then you want to what, uh, reset its user object directory. Yeah, that's exactly where I use this. Yeah, it, 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 one of the places. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna just. I'm gonna add that to my. You know, my for my team. Like always, make it empty. Why not? It, 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 I just. I do it manually out of habit. I mean, I created a data set, and I. I just. I immediately make a snapshot of add empty. Yep. My one thought is that if an attacker knows anything about ZFS, that the first thing they'll do is just roll back aggressively to anything named empty within a few seconds and run like <laughs> hell and laughing, <laughs> <laughs> laughing away. Thank you for ruining that for me, Michael. Oh, you're yeah, welcome. Uh, anyway, there is, I guess there is. But that. I definitely considered that. Go ahead. That's a good point. The, the other thing the is, if that can happens, roll back snapshots, you have bigger problems. There's so much yeah. more nasty <laughs> things they can do than be loud and obvious. Oh well, yeah, but an RM dash RF on a you know a recent snapshot, and then the terabyte behind it will take some time, as opposed to boom, have a nice day, asynchronous destroy, boom. How realistic is it that they have the ability to uh, roll back snapshots, but not the ability to list them? Delegated, delegated, delegated. Anyway, so other no, no. There. In that case, the, you can the, the one, the one the, thing. Dot .zfs directory, go to snapshot, do an ls. The one thing that I do want to mention here, and this is something that I have gotten bitten by in the real world, um, if somebody rolls you back to an empty snapshot or just a very old snapshot, you better catch it before your next offsite replication happens. Oh, because point, yeah. unlike deleting stuff, if you get rolled back, you're going to destroy your backups as well. 
Now, when I found that out the hard way, it wasn't deliberate malice. It was just an incredibly advanced idiot. But said incredibly advanced idiot decided that it would be a great idea to roll back a virtual machine all the way to the gold image. And he didn't bother telling anybody thought, when that virtual machine broke. I, oh, thought it was I nice. barely caught it before it replicated offsite. It had already wiped out the onsite hot spare. And I was only an hour away from losing my offsite DR when I actually figured out what the hell was going on and immediately stopped all replication. And I had to run that client directly off of their offsite DR for like a week while I slowly replicated back onto the production site. And then I could rearrange the DNS and get them actually running out of the right facility again. It sucked. I, I thought it was possible when you're doing replication to say, don't delete any snapshots, that, even though they've been deleted in the sending pool, don't delete them from the receiving pool. It's that was slightly nervous. different when you roll back. Hmm. Well, I'm talking about a manual rollback operation. I'm, but I'm talking about if you if a snapshot is removed, which happens on a rollback from the sending pool to a replicated receiving pool, you can tell it not to remove those, I thought. I thought that's another one of those, for Dan, lots of dashes are good options. Because, yeah, Jim, was that with the force flag? And that's how it yeah, that's that's force flag, isn't yeah. it? Like, I don't, the, yeah, yes, you don't have yes, that, but if you're not going to remove them, hang on. If you're doing <laughs> automated replication, you have to use the force flag, or something as simple as somebody doing an LS on the target will break you. Uh -huh. If you're not using the force flag, you cannot rely on that replication actually succeeding because there's a million ways to break it on the other end that nothing will overcome until you go in and manually mess with it. You mount your I'll give you, I'll give, I'll give you five years of experience that said that's not quite true. I, I, I think that I think that using using roll rollbacks with clones is is a you know is an obvious benefit of, of ZFS. And then you know read only if you're not using something. It's it's it takes zero seconds to uh, to add that bit of scaffolding to prevent to prevent that. I've I've never used dash dash. I've never used force flag. On, on backups. So, in fact, I, I yeah, I've done everything I can to avoid using the dash f. So yes, I, so I, I do. Scary. I do read only read only backups because why would they? Because you, when you need them, you need them. Like you, you make it, you make a clone, you mount the clone, you get your stuff back. That's that's so easily scriptable. I'd I wouldn't I wouldn't do dash f with a backup. And it takes being burned to that appreciate some that. systems mount the. Um, backed up data sets um, writable and then it's quite easy to have no, to force it back into alignment because you actually uh, accidentally modified anything especially if it's the data set like your mail spool where you actually have access times uh, just running a cat can uh, create a diff which would break it so yeah do not your backups writable if you can avoid it. Clone them. This is related to Michael. This is sort of related to your your idea of you know of snapshotting on uh, on written, and then you know and then your your whatever snapshot system that that works that way knows who the primary is based on the amount of written data. So if you if you have a little bit of scaffolding that, that sets sets read only the things that shouldn't be rolled back and or, or shouldn't be replicated I, I mean i don't think there's I, I think that that you can you can be really you can be really safe and have the absolute minimum number of permissions on your backup user okay Amen. Uh, that's a sort of parallel discussion related to Zelta and such. So I'm, I'm so glad to hear the different experiences here. And of course, to state the obvious, we've all been burned by one of these things at some point. So then you you change your ways. <laughs> so yeah, Delta anyway. by design does not have a dash F option. Yeah. You have to, it's like, it's like, sorry. Michael, go stop asking. Root. Exactly. Go, go be rude. You, you know how to do ZFS rename. Congratulations. You don't need dash F. 
honestly, there there's your big answer for what Zelda does differently than Synchroid. Like, like there's yeah. no snark whatsoever. Like that is a great answer for why would you want Zelda instead of Synchroid? Because you've made a design decision that I'm absolutely not going to follow because I'm there are a lot of ways to create breakage by refusing to use Dash F that far more people will fall afoul of. And I know that right. from long experience. <laughs> right. Unless you start with Zelda, which doesn't let you, you know, make mountain mistakes and uh and stuff like that. So I think that I think that creating a suite of tools around ultra ultra safe backups for very dumb admins is is possibly an angle that that I could I could work on. Like just the dumbest admin on earth. I want to I want to build a tool. You you, you built a tool for smart down. guys. Rodney, that Every was time you admin. think you made something idiot for the universe, yeah, that's, that's, what idiot. I, that's what I said when I that's what I said when I then I when I told somebody about it the first time is I get calls when I got home from a party at three a.m. after going out with my wife, having a drink or two. Can I get the host back up safely? Onto the uh, you know get it get it over to the to its to its uh, twin to the to the host twin without screwing up without breaking something. All right. Anything else on that? Uh, so conclusion on empty. Should there maybe be a flag in ZFS upstream that just says, "Hey, new data sets." Uh, Always get a snapshot I, empty, I think or should it be just a maybe utility or just? I think you're right, Michael. I think it's that little tiny extra bit of attack surface that nobody needs. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. want to be right. I, I think it should yeah. be possible to implement it without actually creating the snapshot. You can just ZFS could have a, a instead of ZFS destroy, you could have ZFS empty as a command that simply rewound a data set. To empty. Interesting. If, Let's if go that's there. Actually, possible without yeah. actually creating the data set, I would agree. Uh, the snapshot, I would agree. I'm. Well, not I was about to say it's sure. almost like a hidden one, right? Go ahead. Sorry, Jim. Yeah, that, which which was something I was going to suggest. If you're going to do it, I would I would say just have a hidden snapshot that's automatically created. The problem there is just that while the cost of a snapshot is very low, and especially on an empty data set. It is not zero, and I'm not sure that we're aware of all the use cases somebody might have, for example, for you know suddenly programmatically creating 10,000 data sets. And if they also have to create 10,000 snapshots of all those empty data sets, it's going to make a big impact. The, the, the ZFS empty command would not actually need a snapshot. Hmm. And I believe it would actually be rather simple to implement it. And it's, you're just all you're going to do is you're going to free the chain of pointers, um, and release all the blocks that are allocated to it, and all the snapshots and everything else. The um, I lost a train of thought. I'm sorry. If, if that's possible without the snapshot, then yeah, that's ideal. And I zero pushback on yeah. that. Sounds like a great idea. I just yeah, don't I know think it should it's possible be or not. I. I think it should be possible to do it without the snapshot. And and that would eliminate the rollback thing. And then you could probably make the part that you had to chant magic music at to get it to accept it. Right. No What's seatbelts? It's, 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 it's no different than being able to execute ZFS destroy. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you know, that's right. A rollback to empty, just, just ZFS destroy. You know, ZFS destroy pool name dash recurse is yep. destructive. Indeed. Yeah. So I'm, All right. I'm back on I'm back on your team. <laughs> cool. Okay. And the advantage of the empty is you don't have to recreate it and for, forget all the options you used originally. It's right. Just, all the yes! yeah, all the properties. <laughs> yes. And one one of the things that reminds me of is that Bacula does everything it can to not 
delete your actual data. It'll remove it from the catalog. It'll forget about the jobs. It won't be able to tell you what files are in there, but it absolutely has to be out of space and can't do anything else. And you have said that, yes, you can use this. There's it's, another it's use very, for empty it, that just that, holds on to it. And, and that's ZFS diff. You can use it if you have an empty data set, you can use it in a diff to to see the, 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 the get a ZFS style difference from of all the files that you created in the data set. Yeah, somebody made like a like a I think he called this tool hot tub time machine. That that uh, was like a graphical. Uh, I don't know. It was, it was, I, I, I forget. It was like a midnight commander that lets you compare data sets. Uh, I don't remember um, asking. Not, uh, not useful, but, uh, but pretty, but a fun toy. The, the ZF diff reminds me of asking, uh, PJB Powell if he could somehow give me a list of all the files that have changed since, since a certain date. Because that would make uh, differential backups a lot easier for software. You don't have to actually inspect all the M, M times. You just get a list. But that, that was long ago, and I don't think anything happened. I... CFS diff basically outputs that list of files that have changed, been added, moved, or, in, uh, yeah, or removed. So. Since the last snapshot. Yes. Uh, no. Between, or between to, two snapshots. Be I don't be, know for certain if you can use bookmarks. For, for a backup, it to. has to be as of a certain date. Because the, the backup software knows when it last did a, an update, a backup. So it, it, it can't be a diff between two things. It's got to be from a date. <laughs> And yeah, the output I wonder, doesn't have dates, does it? Sorry. No, but I, I'm wondering, ZFS has this, what is Wait. it called? It's a serialized, it's an ever-increasing, monotonically increasing number, not monotonically. Transaction it's, number. Yeah, the transaction number. If you could actually, you could, is can you ask ZFS to give me everything that changed since this transaction? That would be a real interesting way to do backups. And I think... Um, hold on, let him finish. I think that's actually how the underlying ZFS send between snapshots actually works. I think the snapshot just stores a transaction ID, doesn't it? It says, this snapshot is, is, is the data set at this transaction. ID. So anything Take after that transaction ID is new. Same with the bookmark, so, especially. All right. Uh, yeah, bookmark. One thing oh, I would assume that any ZFS aware backup software, uh, so any software which knows that ZFS offers this kind of functionality, would also back up a snapshot instead of uh, basically a fuzzy blurry backup of the file system while it's changing. So because of that, you would always have a snapshot as your last point in time you backed up. So you can use that to compare against the current state of a file system, or you more realistic, you take a new uh, snapshot under a like working name, not a permanent name potentially, and then you can do a diff between the, the old snapshot, if you still have it, or a bookmark, and the uh, new one. And then ZFS div gives you the list you've been asking for then. And do note you have the mountable snapshot directory dot ZFS for what it's worth, and you should just aim your backup tools there, just saying, if and they are not ZFS aware at the other end. If you want to put a timestamp in your uh, uh, snapshot name, you can. That you have enough characters to encode a reasonable, the human readable and precise timestamp for backup purposes. If you don't want to rely on any of the metadata fields, 
you can just use the name. So that seems like it should be doable in less than 100 lines of shell. The and there was a is why do you at that point really okay if you want to do a non ZFS replication based snapshot then it makes sense to use ZFS get. So just it's... a quick point you could have a pretty significant uh, skew between the uh, the host system time and whatever time you manually punch in there. So yeah, you may indeed want those separate. Just hypothetically. The question is, do you even really want to rely on wall clock for the, these kinds yeah, of things? I don't even think wall you clock and time. distributed systems um, is normally just an accident ready to happen. All true. Is that W A L or O L? I'm spacing it. Anyway, wall clock as in the clock hanging on a wall showing the human time, ah, yes. which moves back and forth and has to be synchronized. And your system clock is never perfectly in sync with it. Yep. OK, great discussion. Other topics? We are at just about an hour, not that there's a hard limit for all. Jim, are there any podcasts you'd like to make known to the group? Well, I mean, not unless you count 2.5 admins. Jim is a co-host of that show, and it's rather good. And bless your hearts, the music is brief, and the show is overall quite short, so it's very consumable compared to some that just keep going. So I want to, I haven't thanked you and yet for I, that. Thank you. I could use a little, I could use a little more life. I, I love it. Um, Jim, one thing I've was, always wondered about the podcast, are certain segments from each week or each episode repeated? Uh, I mean, the ones like, uh, and now it, like, like the intro and the uh, uh, talking about uh, sponsors and stuff like that. Uh, is, no, is it? Re okay. I no, uh, Joe does very little of that. He he doesn't he doesn't generally can and reuse things like that. He uh, he does a live read pretty much every episode, every show. Um, he'll only resort to surgery with something old if like he gets backed into a a real corner, which that's not the kind of corner he typically gets backed into when he gets backed into one. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other thing, uh, Michael mentioned podcasts, but if any of y'all don't know, I run a site called uh, practicalzfs.com. Right now, it's just a discourse, which is you know a forum instance. I do have plans to you know add more documentation and and uh, articles and this and that and the other eventually. But um, basically, if any of you were active on Reddit RZFS and have noticed how completely that has gone to shit, <laughs> you might want to check out Practical ZFS. That is a very good point. And let's maybe take a quick look. By the at way, that. this. this... Go ahead, Dan. Way, this... Yeah, Dan, I, I, I much Dan's got prefer the floor. it to. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan Langell, sorry, let's go. And then Dan, Daniel B, go ahead. By the way, the cert on that site, Jim, doesn't go for just the root domain. It, it's not valid for practicalzfs.com, but it is. Yeah, for the I know. Basically, if you're going to just practicalzfs.com, you've already done something kind of weird because you're not going to find it listed in a Google result anywhere. <laughs> um, that'll change when I actually have a site for practicalzfs.com. The issue right now is that it's either either I let it 404 or I spin up a second site or I just go ahead and and you know let it uh, load up. I, I just haven't created a separate V host because... Yeah. When you set up discourse, it really wants to run in a container, and I really don't want to mess around inside that container. So I would actually need to have practicalzfs.com running off of a separate IP address, which I can. I just haven't wanted to bother with all that until I actually have something to put there, which I don't yet. So that's kind of where that, that that's that's where that there sits is, right now. Oh, so you need a separate vhost. There is a vhost for that domain that's just got the wrong cert, the, the, the other cert. 
No, there's only one V host and it's a wildcard V host. Yeah. It answers everything yeah. Yeah. because that's the, that's the way the yeah. container for, for discourse comes mm -hmm. down the pike. And the way that's set up, I really don't want to dive into its internals. As far as I'm concerned, discourse is a black box. Um, I'm not trying to get in there and treat it as a Unix server that I can, you know, dick around inside directly because they just, that is way too incestuous of a build for that. Either, so. Anyway, I much prefer it to uh, Reddit. Anyway, I think it's I think it's great. It's a big improvement. Yeah, thank honestly, you. I don't think it's a huge improvement over RZFS when I was running it, but I, I do drop in on RZFS every now and again since, and that is not the same place anymore. Yeah. I basically just drop into RZFS once every week or two to it, see if there's anything just too horribly egregious that I can't bear to let it go unchallenged. <laughs> just because, you know, I mean, I've spent, you know, more than a decade of my life promoting the hell out of ZFS. And, you know, so basically that's my remaining interest in RZFS is making sure it doesn't turn into a poison pill for the fucking file system. Amen. Well, Pardon ahead, my friend. Who's moderating that now, Jim? Is that you? I used to, mo I moderated RZFS for, I think, like five years. Um, I do not moderate it any longer. I stepped down uh, when mm -hmm. when Spez started showing his ass last year. Um, I thought that Spez made it very clear that he had absolutely no respect for Reddit's users and contributors. And uh, basically, it was to the point that the only way I was going to continue to use it is if there was a major apology and formal policy changes that none of which happened even in the slightest. So I could either be a hypocrite and stay, or I could, you know, not be a hypocrite and I could leave. So I left and I spun up a replacement, invited everybody to join me. Uh, the Proxmox community, the, the better parts of the Proxmox community also followed me over there. Cool. Uh, Katya, do you have any questions for the group? Don't be intimidated. Uh, this is just as much your call as it is ours. I have to say it is intimidating a little, but oh, uh, I'm sorry. No, no. I mean, it was really interesting to hear a lot of arguments, but good ones. And and thank you so much uh, for letting me in. I don't have any questions at the moment. Okay. Yeah, we're uh, ready when you are. As a <laughs> as an admin who's not. Uh, uh, that much exper experience. I, I do appreciate having the Zelda scripts. It makes my life much easier. <laughs> I do need to <laughs> bother Daniel less on a daily basis. So, yeah, I guess thank you. <laughs> of course, you would, you would like you would like so you would like Syncway just as much. I promise. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would love to give it try <laughs> for sure. If you've ever used rsync, my real initial design goal for Syncoid was rsync but ZFS, and uh, I yeah. think it comes pretty close. Yeah, we we have that in common. Yeah. Yeah, and for those who have tried ZX for, there's like an rsync mode that at first I wanted to just strip out of it, but it was so intertwined. I thought, ah, oh, no, darn. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so it had yeah. some interesting, I'm it did so have to have some interesting design concepts around being super precious about the, um, about properties, yep. which I thought was, which I thought was kind of interesting, um, which, which actually is kind of nice if you're, if you're trying to do delegated. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know. I guess I just thought it wasn't worth it. Cool. Yeah, uh, we did play with it a little. Yeah, we used to it for like a year. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Cool. Uh, from show and tell mode, I've been for the last oh, 12 hours running OpenZFS222 on Windows just to smoke test it. And hey, I'm, uh, Jorgen's been working hard on that. So I'm Grateful for that. Everyone deserves a decent file system. Oh, uh, I've got a I've got a DFS question that I brought sure. up on the call long ago, Please. but we have a different group of people now. Does anybody have ZFS on Mac experience? 
Got because it. I set up, yep. I set up, I had a, I had a eight, eight NVMe pool, mirrored pool, and it worked great. It was, it was amazing. But Unity, specifically Unity, even though I gave it full disk access, even though I gave, you know, uh, everything I could surrounding surrounding it, it was completely blind to the pool. You just this one program. Why would a single program? What is and Unity? Now, Unity is a, it's a, it's a, it's a development kit, and it has a ton of. It does have a billion binaries under it. Um, like but the yeah, game dev a, environment. A, okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, you. you got okay. it. It was for a video game company. And it's probably it trying to use APFS attributes that don't exist on ZFS. Macs have Maybe. Mac file systems have some really weird attributes that do not match up to anything I've seen and in any other file system anywhere else. One of the nice things which macOS had uh, for a long time is file level copy on write. It does. So it does have copy on write. It's just no, no file level copy on write as in an unprivileged process can do a copy on write on a file and then you can mutate both and it will just like memory on fork be uh, duplicated as needed as it diverges then you have That's cool. all the resource fork stuff so for example if you had something like a uh, Imagine Git, but for large files, you could just take a, a cheap uh, but complete copy every time you check something in. You don't have to keep a full copy uh, for your history, stuff like that. Mm. But the more common problems uh, you will run into is like um, storing resource forks the way the system expects or just case sensitive versus insensitive. So uh, I had software where when I tried it like years ago on, uh, on macOS that uh, didn't work as expected. And I found out that, yeah, the software is just too stupid to decide on a case uh, for its folder name. So there were two folders, one containing one half of a file, the other, the other one uh, of the files. And yeah. Because normally macOS is only uh, case preserving, not case sensitive. Uh, this worked out, but yeah. The problem hmm. is that Apple really dislikes um, any kernel modules written by anyone but them. Right. So uh, really, uh, it was risky it. for sure. You so you always have to fight against that. So unless you have your system set up as your lo local developer system with all of that and then self-sign it for you, it's hard to install. If your yes. system is under full control of an MDM service, you can use it to whitelist um, developer or organization certificates so that you can uh, install without warnings or having to do lots of workarounds uh, just to whitelist kernel modules. But yeah, it's heavily discouraged. Mm, it's, too, provide... it's too bad I couldn't get it working. I mean, it was a perfect, it was just the perfect situation to use CFS. Just absolutely, absolutely perfect. I mean, it's like a, sure, if you have a nice terabytes of Git, lots... you know? Terabytes of what? Of like uh, Git code, you know. It's just, it's just so much. I, it would have been, it would have been perfect to run that, you know, compressed in memory, and so on. Yes, There's just a million different reasons, and I, I couldn't. I just, it just was blind. It could not see. Hmm. The, it just could not see the bond. So yeah, well, I, so, I, I guess ZFS does. So those... If it's the case preserving problem, ZFS datasets can be created. Oh, another thing to watch out for is that uh, macOS uses a different Unicode normalization than most Unicode UTF-8 systems. Uh, so you have to, and that's a create time only option for the data set. So that paths are encoded with the right uh, Unicode uh, normalization words. 
So let's right. say yes, you I, want I, I, was, to I was pretty much pasting the full this. create from the yeah from the from the ZFS on Mac site. So I didn't scrutinize those maybe as much as I should have. Hmm. So, well, I want to give it but, another shot. I got the box right over there. Oh, um, you do. So Jorgen is very interactive. He's great. I've used uh, Mac OS ZFS since the Zevo days. And it's treated me well short of recent uh, encrypted sends, but somehow Zelta fixed that maybe with large blocks or something. So I'm quite delighted with it. And I'm, I've been exercising it. However, he pointed out real early on that we may never have proper root on ZFS on Mac because things like Apple fonts <laughs> have massive amounts of be it resource forks or preview metadata no. and other stuff that would just, that just blew up. So yeah, Apple does Apple things. So all right, well I'm on these calls so I can start oh. knowing people. So maybe I should reach out. That would that might be interesting. I hope that's an interesting problem. I could ask him. Yeah. Oh, he's totally so, accessible. Just uh, he's on their Slack channel if you happen to be on it. But go ahead, Jan. So uh, ZFS can store um, extended attributes. So there is a place where the resource fork could be naturally mapped. I don't know if it's implemented, but it's possible I mean, to store a resource for Even Apple no longer uses it a lot because the firm format you're probably thinking about is the original um, font format on Mac for post fix type, uh, post um, script type one fonts, which even Adobe deprecated last year as in they broke existing uh, documents by removing this functionality. Oh, the only way to to uh, open your documents is to install the version which will become unable to be installed via their cloud subscription in a few months. So yeah, uh, it's just an ongoing clusterfuck to uh, deprecate this uh, format because there is no real way to convert for fonts losslessly and interesting and lots of organizations have uh font archives going back decades when yep. fonts were just cheap and you got a full cd of fonts and these days uh the yeah the font forgers have uh, insane ideas like wanting to license per view or something goodness <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Or you mm. might, may not uh, use it for non-vegan products or something. <laughs> it was the craziest uh, restriction I had seen. Uh, Seriously. Actual font. Yes. Oh goodness. Oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, no, uh, basically a Peter-like license. Uh, it's off topic, but I I love it. Yeah. <laughs> the real problem is that modern Macs have macOS heavily relies on the APFS snapshots for system updates. So basically the Mac OS is uh, similar to iOS these days, is updated by downloading a new snapshot and then atomically rebooting into it. Hmm. The core Mac OS is immutable these days. It's kind of hidden through a concept they call firm links so that it looks like it's on the same file system, but it isn't. For example, when using the auto mounter, uh, you will uh, run into this, that the slash volumes directory isn't the directory you expect it to be, <laughs> which yeah. will then end up with auto mounter files looking something like this. Um, You're dropping that in chat. Uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. cool. Anything else for this call? And Dan L, I'm curious, did you see that the password was either not published or not embedded in the link and maybe it was the old link or something? I want to get that it right. It was a little hard to find it. I I, I kind of had to do a control F passcode in the, in the Google Doc and hope there was something there, which okay. obviously I'll there was because here I am. But Cool. <laughs> and I know Dan Langell had some trouble too. So, uh, okay, uh, I'll just throw in syntax here because, hey, it doesn't cost much to add more. Uh, mount. 
So then, this is if you want to have an NFS uh, share be automated to your volumes directory. You have to cheat and trick the automant uh, in, or AutoFS into accepting this path if it want. normally wouldn't let you use by, first of all, knowing where the real location for your volumes directory is. Mm -hmm. And then using dot dot as a to confuse it. Interest. And how many hours yeah, it did works. it take to figure that out? <laughs> uh, and not long because it, I knew about this. They just, the latest changes with like uh, Mojave or something where they did, uh, finally made the core of the operating system immutable to stop stupid users breaking the systems and to prevent stupid uh, software from breaking user systems hmm. because there was quite a bit of software um, which just uh, didn't give a um, fuck about the convention of the operating systems and just as long as it was possible installed wherever it could. So annoying system integrity protection mode was the first step to uh, change it and then they went a step further now. Yeah. Unless you go into the boot options, uh, as in the firmware boot options, disable system integrity mode, and then mount it, you can no longer get to a point where, where you have a truly writable root file system. And it may be possible that all of the operations they are doing on their snapshots can be mapped to ZFS operations. I don't know if that's possible, but it would have to be done and it would require integrating that into all the tooling for handling system updates, which oh. uh, I don't see a way that uh, anyone but Apple could do that. Anything else at this time or catch some of you tomorrow for the Beehive call and perhaps next week for more ZFS excitement? What's that? Holding up. While we're on the call, and I thought please. it was very appropriate, I got new storage. Oh, please, two, do tell. Two new 12 terabyte drives. So Adding just it spinning dust. Soon. Yes, and it's good. Yeah, you I need put it. three into service over the weekend. You did what, Andrew? The, the, those I, put, are... I put three 12 Ts into service over the weekend, replacing yeah. six Ts. And those of you that can afford big SSDs, and not run the crap out of them quickly? Sorry, I can't. These are about 120 bucks each. Oh, mine are spinning rust, too. <laughs> they might even be the same disks. This is mostly for a backup server. This is a server Except. that has the backups. Yep. And does re repeated things. So, it's a backup server, you probably wouldn't run out of... Um, writes per day or bytes per day write capacity because backups don't change that quickly. Yeah, but how much is that 12 terabyte SSD? But the, it's just not worth the cost. Yeah. Spinning rust is just cheaper and good enough. Yeah, well, it, it, it does backups. It also does a daily load of all the database backups. So that's where a lot of the churn comes in. So every day it gets a copy of the database backups and then restores them all. And that's what one of the one of the things that, that it does. Um, and it's also has then, a time machine and gray log. If you're prepared to play with that, you can probably vastly increase the time to uh, re-import the SQL dumps into a database by take using an async data set. So you create a data set. You import the SQL dump into a database on top of an async data set, and then you set it to uh, inherit again so that you don't have any sync rights during the initial import. Because if it fails, you just re attempt it. Interesting. And then I have a, I have a question only, uh, I think, I think only Jim can answer. How many? Rust drives do you need before it's not worth adding SSD special? 
like just a pair of SSD, like a uh, regular It's always SATA worked. SSD Let special. Jim answer. Hold, hold tight, Jan. Go ahead, Jim. Because it's the, The answer it's the is, seek time. It, it's the seek yeah, time, not it's the the right seat, latency. right? The, the answer Yeah. is moo. There, there is no number at Yep. which a special becomes Yeah. unnecessary, depending on your workload. The, the problem Right. is that if you have a throughput centric workload, uh, a, a relatively large amount of rust disks can handle that just fine. But if you've got an IOP centric workload, I don't care how many spindles you got, it's going to suck on Rust. Yeah, Even if right. you have, So it's infinite. uh, Yeah. uh, even worse, with spinning Rust or even with SATA SSD, there is a minimum latency for a, a durable ride you cannot go get below with just spinning disks. So if you want to have a best, basically, even in any kind of transaction to be persisted to stable storage, it doesn't matter how many spinning disks you have. An IOPS on a disk is an IOPS on a disk. You can get, theoretically, you could, if you had a, enough mirrors, let's say you, you run something crazy like eight-way mirrors or something with eight copies of everything stored on spinning disk, which gives you eight read heads. It would be a red point no longer cheaper than a, a SATA SSDs, but hey, you could do it in theory if you had enough uh, JBOT for it, and it would even give you a reasonable number of IOPS, but you would still have a read latency. And the problem is Oh, that speaking you have to of keep IOPS. your, your uh, I O Q uh, full enough so that basically the disks are always busy. Because otherwise you end up with a ping pong behavior where you're doing a bit of compute and a bit of storage, and then your throughput drops to near nothing if you can't keep the So, graphs. Spe Daniel, yeah. yeah, speaking of speaking of IOPS, uh, used to buy these these fabulous little sixty four. uh 64 gig uh optanes were just were, which were just like hundred dollar best best logs that you can possibly imagine but they don't have they don't have anything quite like that anymore they're all like they're all mixed but but that might be okay i haven't i haven't used any of them any of the new ones but i i can't find these suckers anymore i love That's them because I, I bought because you they don't might discontinued have an SLC wrong. all Intel uh, discontinued all Um, yeah. Optane drives, so the technology Well, they still has been sell, abandoned. they still sell hybrid, right? Flash or, or what do you call it? NAND, NAND Optane combos, As far which as might I know. be okay, but they're more expensive and more space that you don't really need because you really just want the Optane. So Um, the and it's going to burn out. So I don't know what to, what the solution is here. for the S log, your NAND doesn't really burn out because you're basically treating a dedicated S log device as a ring buffer, which is near optimal for um, rare leveling because you won't have any long term allocated blocks. So all blocks get to be reused uh, quickly. then you can vastly over provision them, which is a way which how you can basically get an one drive right per day or so SSD and turn it into a free drive right per day SSD by just having a bunch of unallocated space on there. It's not No, they guaranteed know that there are a that lot of the people rare out leveling there talking is about. far to do that, but in reality I found it that it works out fine. And then if you get a SSD and trust the combination of hardware and firmware, that it truly has a uh, well-written firmware and enough Exactly. uh, capacitors uh, to dump the DRAM to pre-zeroed uh, flash, then you can tr get good write latency with NVMe. But yeah, um, Optane would have been nicer for s but there wasn't enough of a market for it. And it was it's Intel. Okay, Jim. Note that as far as over-provisioning, one very common piece of advice I see floating around out there is to make a small partition on a large drive. 
you don't need to do that. Just use a much larger drive than you would need to store the amount of data that will be in your, your slog. You don't need to monkey around with trying to partition it smaller. You just need a larger SSD. That's all you need because all you're really doing is much like what, what uh, Jan was saying, you're decreasing the amount of total drive writes per day by having a larger drive. Uh, you're basically getting more non-flash cells to spread the load over. And the nice thing about an S-Log is that there is no long-term data except for a minute amount of metadata. So basically everything written through it is quickly uh, dead data again and then available to be recycled. And on NVMe drives, you can in theory also create a new, uh, basically two namespaces. Mm -hmm. yeah, higher end ones, yes. One. No. I Raising haven't seen spaces. a nice 80 millimeter the laptop one because I want to dual boot off two namespaces. <laughs> Just, yeah, I can tell you. I think when Micron U.3 uh, ones can do it, hmm. but that's not something you can fit into a laptop. Okay, anything else? We're at just about an hour and a half. Well, I'm happy to call it. I'll be around a few minutes. Thank you, everyone. And perhaps I'll see some of you tomorrow or next week. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.